I'm Thuy, lecturer from the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. I'd like to put forward a question to Dr. Sam Jones, please. So, Dr. Jones, with your expertise and experience, I would like to seek um, your view. Would you support the view that when a class is overcrowded, if we're having the class size and reducing the syllabus and the teaching hours by the same proportion, we could actually achieve the learning efficiency in terms of skills and knowledge, acquirement, retainment, applicability, and utilization. Thank you. Here. Haiti behind you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I <laughs> okay. I have a question for the last speaker because I was um, uh, elsewhere. I'm sorry about the others. Um, this question um, really raises the issue of um, whether we are measuring. I mean, in as much as I enjoyed your presentation, I myself have been searching for, for these kinds of solutions. Your point about this high association between total factor productivity and labor productivity, I believe that makes sense because Danny, uh, Danny Roderick makes the point capital accumulation is the basis of um, that in East Asia, now that you've included India. But my, my concern, something that I used to discuss with Sanjay Lal himself, are two things in relation to the, the you used other classifications by users, rising stars, falling stars, loss opportunity, and so on, from the same classifications. Now, when you had this graph on TFP on one side, the level, and then technological sophistication, one of the problems with trade data, I, I believe, and I think this is recognized by the late Sanjay Lau, is the fact that we are classifying anyone who exports uh, an item like microchips, and these firms could be really very low-end firms, like the ones in Philippines. My feeling is because you have Malaysia on top of the, of the curve that you have, and Korea below, my problem is it's probably taking care of that, uh, missing something. Simply because Korea, which had a poor capita income, less than that of Malaysia in 1969, only in 79 it overtook and came down a bit because Park Chung-hee was short in 79. 80, it got back, and now it's about four times higher with 50 million people against 30 million people. I'm not sure whether it's telling the same thing. Um, simply because your um, trade data tends to give us the whole thing. The, the link I have with that is, say in a field that I study quite extensively, and I think here value chains help a lot, the drivers. If you're dealing with, say, consumer electronics, or even industrial electronics, they are far less technology intensive than microchips, and yet microchip is a component. So that's why we tend to have this notion that countries that import components, the logical argument we make is they are in low-end sort of areas, and therefore the ones that assemble uh, finished goods. Car assembly, yes, I agree, the drivers are the producers. So I, I'm just wondering whether you might take into account these things. Thank you. Yeah, my first question to Mr. Wu has been more or less asked already, because I was wondering why Mauritius was so high up, South Korea so much down. I said, what is happening? So maybe the answer is here, but you'll respond. Um, secondly, um, Mr. Wu, I wonder whether you could interrogate the conclusions you make, which I think are very good, but many of them would require interrogating the TFP concept itself, because uh, you referred to many processes at work, which I thought maybe in the, either in the further research or whether you have already done it, whether you have linked these conclusions to the process at work over and beyond TFP. Uh, secondly to uh, Professor Nobe, um, yes, it is uh, quite interesting to hear that Kaizen is actually from below. Uh, but now I wanted to, to you to reflect on uh, the fact that in uh, Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew came from above. In uh, Ethiopia, is coming from above. In uh, Tanzania, we see the Kaizen unit is not expanding enough. Could it be that uh, in the initial stage, uh, initiative must come from above? I leave that to you to reflect on. Um, to uh, Sam Jones, you know, 
people who ask questions and when they missed the presentations, I'll risk to, to comment on what you said, even if I'm not here, judging from what we have discussed before. For the case of um, Tanzania, we find quite uh, variations within East Africa by countries. And I think that's, uh, there are good reasons for that, I think. Now, the question is whether you have examined variations within the country. We have large variations of performance between schools in the same environment. And one of the factors which has accounted for that variation is the administration, the quality of the headmaster in making sure that uh, teachers are teaching, uh, hours of uh, learning are observed, and the performance of uh, school boards, ensuring that performance of teachers is actually taking place and the basic supplies are available in the same environment. So I wonder whether you observed that, uh, to be able to say from the differentials, can we learn something about the possibility of improving learning outcomes without necessarily having large budgetary implications? The last point is, uh, does uh, learning outcomes matter? Because I think this is an important area, and in my country, Tanzania, we are moving in that direction to try to measure outcomes. Uh, but uh, do they matter? Because uh, as you were uh, hinting, the learning outcomes in India are quite low. Uh, but it doesn't, does it seem to hold back development? So I wonder whether you have done uh, some study to show whether uh, learning outcomes matter. Because all the, the, when we say education matters, the measures we have seen are in terms of enrollment, achievement in a secondary school, university. But uh, now you are coming with a good concept of learning outcomes. Does it matter? So I, think, I, I think we'll have the panel answer these questions, so we'll start with Sam, if that's okay. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, I'll try and be reasonably brief. So with respect to uh, class size versus uh, syllabus and, and, and what, uh, what um, effects these can have on learning, um, I think from talking generally from the literature, well, I mean, what we find with respect to class size uh, are probably two main findings. So first of all, there's a nonlinear effect of reductions in class size. So it, with very, very large uh, classes, so we're talking you know, 60 plus students, we do tend to find some small gains in, in, in learning outcomes when you reduce the class size. But once you get down to what might be called international norms, so let's say below 40 students per class in a primary school, there's very little evidence that reductions of class size systematically improve learning. And indeed, in uh, places like the US, for example, a lot, although a lot of money has been placed in reducing class sizes, there's very little evidence that this has been you know, systematically useful in improving uh, test scores. But of course, in a context of 90 plus students that you find in some, some areas of East Africa, I think we would generally consider that to be just too much. Um, so what does matter for, for learning seems to be teacher quality. Uh, you know, that's a very difficult thing to really define, but, but having high quality teachers, um, highly motivated teachers with an appropriate incentive structure seems to be far more fundamental than, than let's just say, school inputs that you can count. So uh, that's probably what, what, what we do know. So um, I think that the question about the syllabus is quite interesting, actually. Um, I, I don't know of a lot of literature on that, but what we do know, for example, in, e in East Africa and many African countries, that they, they face the challenge of, of multiple local languages uh, typically, uh, well, often the, the language of instruction is not a language that they speak at home. Uh, and even the syllabus in these countries does not support uh, some of these local languages, even though they're taught. So, for, for example, in, uh, in somewhere like Kenya, uh, rural primary schools can start teaching uh, in a local language for the first few years of education, but there's no syllabus available whatsoever to support that. So these are questions that I think uh, could be uh, researched to a certain extent, but I don't have any uh, specific information about that. Um, with respect to, uh, do learning outcomes matter? I think we can answer that in two ways. First of all, from a human rights perspective, I would say yes, right? I think it's uh, reasonable uh, 
purely, if we see education as a merit good uh, that can uh, be useful in terms of building better citizens, uh, creating dialogue around uh, things uh, in terms of developing uh, information and uh, about health, for example, there's substantial evidence that we need uh, education to support health outcomes and so on and so forth. Does it matter at a macroeconomic level for growth? Um, I think that's a, that would be a, something that one could look at. Uh, we, we do know from a macro standpoint, uh, I, I mentioned it actually in, in the presentation, that, that, that what matters for growth are test scores and not the quality of, uh, and not the quantity of education. So we do know that from cross-country variation. It would be interesting to see whether we see that from the micro-evidence within country variation. But what we find, for example, in Africa, we don't really have very good uh, information about, for example, GDP growth at the local level to, to see that. But that could be something to, to look at. Uh, the last point I'll make is that, uh, yes, we have looked a little bit at, at, at variation within regions, but uh, one of the challenges we face with this data is that the, the, the information we have at the school level isn't very good quality. Uh, but that's something we can, we can look at it a bit more. Thank you, Samia, for uh, asking question. Uh, yes, uh, Ethiopia is very top down, but uh, <coughs> I hope the uh, you know, kai spread of Kaizen in Tanzania will be more you know, bottom up. Uh, for example, the, in your country, the uh, hospital sector, I mean the health sector, is uh, adapting Kaizen very rapidly. And then people can feel the you know, good impact of the adapt adoption. So I think the awareness may you know, increase from that kind of activities. Um, but uh, at the same time, when the you know, demand is crea being created, uh, uh, you have to have a, you know, increase the supply. So then the Tanzania uh, Kaizen unit is uh, making great effort, but uh, I think a little bit more push is need needed. So the two months ago, you helped me a lot to uh, no, talk to the, your president, and then the, your vice president came to my university the next month. So I hope the, you know, they understand the importance of the, that kind of uh, you know, human resource development. And then uh, a little more help, because the, until the market is really created for the, you know, training and the consulting uh, services, the, some kind of the government intervention would be needed. And then, uh, demand side, the government can you know, uh, boost awareness through the media campaign, but also helping the health sector in your, uh, the case of your country. And at the same time, the supply side, you have to nurture a greater number of uh, trainers, maybe trainers of trainers training. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Three minutes, okay. Okay, thank you for the, uh, the uh, question and comments, but um, Let's first uh, talk about um, the TFOP versus you know the index of uh, technological sophistication uh, numbers. But then, if you have to, uh, uh, if you recall that how we, it is actually constructed, then using uh, trade data at the three digital levels. So uh, obviously, uh, the for example, China uh, is in terms of a score actually highly ranked, like a 3.75, because uh, they uh, tend to export a big chunk of uh, high-tech nature of our products. But but there is some obviously caveats. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about it when you construct the data. But uh, at the three digit level, then even uh, uh, same high-tech categories, you could actually uh, contain uh, highly sophisticated uh, products such as mobile phones, but at the same time, much, much simpler, like uh, some plastic, you know, the, uh, uh, the phone shell, the, the, the case, could be also uh, categorized under the same uh, uh, the high-tech uh, uh, classification. So, obviously, uh, you cannot tell the, uh, the differences in a much, much uh, finer uh, uh, that uh, differences. So that's kind of a, uh, one uh, the uh, problem. But then, this is more a, the second uh, aspect is much more a significant, significant problem because rapid rise of international um, production network, like a global value chain, and then unbundling these production uh, stages, 
across the uh, different uh, location, different countries. Therefore, uh, aggregate uh, trade statistics doesn't tell much about us, uh, the, uh, to us, uh, what is the uh, process, what production stage has been involved. So uh, obviously there is a great uh, difficulties in uh, precisely capturing the, the uh, magnitude, either technology or a TFP, which I'm gonna turn in in a, a minute. But, but uh, I guess that uh, you know, the, rather than uh, this detailed differences, rather if you look at a big pictures and clearly there is a tendency of uh, technology and then uh, this sophistication of the uh, export uh, tend to go uh, together. But then second point though, this value chains. Um, since I'm documenting more uh, macroeconomic uh, the level, you know, the data, so I didn't uh, show anything, but, but there is a huge amount of micro uh, data uh, evidence pointing into uh, uh, the positive impact, you know, uh, backward linkages or forward, forward linkages within this uh, global value chains. So again, that could be uh, uh, very important elements at the micro level, but uh, since we're focusing in the uh, macro uh, aspect, so uh, there was not maybe, a, uh, it's not there, but, but uh, clearly I presume, I believe it is happening there. But then the second, the regarding uh, Mauritius compared to uh, Korea, uh, if you remember how actually we construct the TFP, although including Bob Solo and then, uh, many other economists believe TFP is a good measure of uh, technological progress, but, uh, but in the end then it is obtained as a residuals after you accounting for the uh, uh, contribution from the capital stock, human capital and labor. But then uh, in the case of Korea, uh, if you look at it, uh, human capital measures for instance, then in terms of uh, maybe PhD, I heard uh, being a Korean, I heard that uh, elsewhere though, uh, Korea has a highest number of a PhD per capita. So if you take the numbers uh, when you consider the TFP, then uh, much less left to be uh, captured by the TFP. And then Mauritius opposite, much low level capital stock and then human capital, then given the uh, rapid growth, we, we already know and then no one can dispute. So obviously bigger chunk will be attributed to the uh, TFP contribution. So that kind of a things I think well known in the literature. So uh, uh, I think that's kind of a, a cautious, you know, the uh, tales we have to think of. But then the final point regarding our processing uh, export. This is much again a bit harder because uh, as I said, uh, even more difficult now because of a rise of international uh, production network. So we have to think about it, what production stage is actually contributing how much in terms of a technological upgrading. Uh, but then in the China context, interesting enough, this processing exports dominated by the uh, foreign affiliates, uh, foreign uh, invested uh, companies. In other words, FDI. I show you some of the strong evidence at the macro level, FDI and the capital, in, the equipment import having a very strong impact on the TFP growth. So to the extent that this air processing export also engaged by these foreign affiliates, then on top of this uh, value chains, backward linkages and forward linkages positive impact on the TFP growth, but on top of that, clearly uh, this uh, might have additional uh, impact uh, um, meanings uh, uh, export uh, process, you know, could have uh, uh, technological, you know, the uh, learning uh, components. But uh, just very quick, yeah, one final uh, observation though in the literature, I guess that uh, they could not solve the issues whether you simply export more than you learn more or simply because you are actually better producing something, therefore are you becoming an exporter. And um, uh, my sense of the uh, reading the recent literature is actually pointing into uh, the second, meaning in general, highly productive companies, they tend to become uh, exporter rather than simply trying to, you know, the export and an export, then you becoming better, uh, not because of that. Thank you. Okay, so sorry we're late for coffee, but we'll just give the speakers a round of applause and conclude the session. So thank you all for your contributions.